was able to arrange to have him come up and, and talk to us. And so there's, there's several things that are going on here. He's, um, Dan has written four books. Um, one of them uh, is a kind of fascinating book about uh, uh, the longest baseball game ever, 33 innings, and it happened in Pawtucket. So, sure, uh, 33 innings in Pawtucket. I think it went over a couple of days, but it was, uh, uh, at, but more recently, um, he's written this incredibly moving piece um, about unmarried mothers in Ireland. Um, it's a story in a little town called Chum, um, and it's, um, well, he has a, a piece that we'll show on video that will give you some sense of what's going on. But we're going to arrange this where Ed uh, is, in essence, going to interview Dan, and we'll have a conversation, and then open up some questions at the end. And um, I just want to thank Dan Barry for making himself available. He's a, he's a, as part of the Providence Journal team, he won a Pulitzer Prize. He was nominated for two other Pulitzers. He's a very serious guy, and we're happy to have him back in Rhode Island. So let's give him a warm welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you want to? I'll give you this mic. How many people have to be here for a class? Is it most of the... Just me. Just me. Just you. Um, but yeah, you're in for a real treat today. I think Dan is the finest storyteller uh, in the country right here, and he's been telling stories at the Providence Journal. He told a lot of stories about mobsters up on Federal Hill and Buddy Cianti at the at City Hall and uh, about the longest game in baseball history at McCoy Stadium. And uh, most recently, he told the story um, from Ireland, from, from Chum. And so we're just, for, the, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, you're going to get a little synopsis here. Uh, and this is the way a lot of the journalism students that uh, just heard Dan are going to be telling stories in the future, uh, both in print and uh, online and with video and audio. And it, it's a really w well done documentary. Um, it lasts about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to uh, turn the tables on Dan and interview him. He's used to asking the questions. He's going to have to answer them today, and then we're going to open it up to you guys so you can grill him, too. We always passed those 10-foot high walls, and I used to wonder why was there broken glass all along the top of the wall. I remember the children in school just vaguely, and I do remember they were segregated from the rest of us. We weren't allowed to play with them. These were like a different species at the time. My mother got pregnant of sight of marriage, and of course, that was a big sin. And the priest in the parish got to hear about it and told her parents that it was an awful disgrace, that she couldn't be seen out because she'd be a bad influence. So th they told her then that when the baby is due, that she was to be taken to Chum, the home in Chum, and the nuns would look after her there. Then he opened the door and told her she'll have to leave. And she said, I want my son. And they just closed the door on her face. And every week then she would walk in the center of June, out the Dublin Road, every week for five and a half years, knocking on the door. I want to take my son out there. That's my son you have in there. I want to rear him. I want to look after him. And they said, no, he's got to be fostered out. And that was it. I have no memories of it. I was there for four and a half years. There was a hedge each side of us and a crowd of us walking. That's the only memory I have. I thought I was an animal at one stage. I used to get dreams at night that I, that I was growing horns. And when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do, such a sigh of relief. There was no love, there was no care. What happened in the home? You know, it can happen to you, that you can block things out at such a young age. I 
I suppose at the back of my mind, it, it was there in the subconscious, wondering about the children. I thought it'd be just a simple history, the history of the Bonsecour sisters and how they worked and how they operated. I thought I'd go to the local library and thought I'd get a, 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 a volume of, of information in the home to work on. There was absolutely nothing. So I went to the local people and I said, that's the best way to find out information. And locals were a bit hesitant to say, oh, the poor little children in there, they were, you know, they were treated badly. An odd person to tell you, they remember screaming in the home. It was still very much a hush-hush affair. But I was gathering all this information in the back of my mind and getting a picture. And it was only then I got the story of uh, back in the 1970s that the two boys found uh, bones of children in a tank. I've often thought about it afterwards, like, you know, what did we come across? Like, it was a chamber, a HA chamber. You know, and the amount of bones that were in it, there was a good few. Like, what we came across in 1972 was reported, and the government knew about it, but yet they didn't do anything about it. This whole story wouldn't get out of my head, so I had to follow it. I had to determine who was buried there. First of all, of course, I asked the Bonscore sisters, and they said they had no knowledge or no records whatsoever of any burial in the home and uh, got onto the county council who owned the land then, and they had no records of burials either. So um, I wondered then, my thoughts went then to how many children actually uh, died in the home. That's an inspector's report for the Tume home from 1947. It uh, shows the condition of the babies and toddlers, and it makes very uh, harrowing reading. You have a 13 month old baby in the care of Bonsecour sisters who are a nursing congregation. You have a miserable, emaciated child with voracious appetite and no control over body functions, probably mentally defective. Wizened limbs, three months old, wizened limbs. Three weeks old, emaciated and delicate. And that was the, um, the Excel copy of the deaths of the babies and children. Unbelievable. Okay, all these deaths, where are they buried? They're not in the main June graveyard. They're not in the mother's hometown graveyards. It is becoming quite obvious what has happened. At the time, there was a, a lot of um, questioning my findings that it wasn't possible. And I was asking myself, is it the fact that there were illegitimate children? Is this stigma still around? That people just still don't care? It just made me more determined to fight this and to say, these children have to be there. People have to know about it. contacted me and said, had you a sibling? I said, no, I never heard of. But according to um, what we find in here, she says, there is um, a name. Marion Bridget Mulrine was born to um, Peter's mother, Delia, in 1954. You can see it there. Same mother, same address. She says, could be your sister. Ryan, 10 months. 1955. 1955. Yeah. They said she died from convulsions, but uh, there's no doctors to certify that she died or where she was buried. I couldn't find out where she was buried. To this day, I don't even know. She could be sold off to America like a lot more it was done. It has been said that children were trafficked across to the United States. Of the 796 children, maybe uh, some of those have been adopted illegally. And uh, that is a very serious matter, if, if that is so. We took their babies and we gifted them 
Are we sold them? Are we trafficked them? Are we starved them? Are we neglected them? Are we denied them? To the point of their disappearance from our hearts and from our sight, from our country, and in the case of Tume, possibly other places, from life itself. The state were complicit, of course they were. They were paying the sisters. Did the, did the county council look into these burials? Did they not question what was happening to these children? Where were they? Did they care? Did they turn a blind eye? And why did not one nun come forward and say, it was wrong what we did in June? For a person that was supposed to be baptised, they're not supposed to put into unconsecrated ground. Yes, what did the church do? Put them in there and went and covered up those sites and put a playground on top of it. How would they feel about it if it their sister or brother that was in there? The government is the government and the church is the church. And it's like knocking a brick wall, isn't it? There's seven years taken out of my life I don't know anything about. And it wasn't my fault that I came into this world. I, had, I didn't choose. I had no say in the matter. I just get the sense of the babies down there. They're there under me. And I feel that there's some way I could help them. Just to get them out there and give them a proper proper burial. That's what I just love. And you know, you cannot right wrongs, but things need to be recognised for what they were like. stuff. Dan, um, tell us about what the reaction has been to the story. You know, did you have a lot of people responding to it or are they too busy following the president's Twitter feed these days? Um, so when I was writing this story, um, I really thought I was um, in a separate place from the rest of my colleagues at the time. Everyone was focused on Trump or the Las Vegas shootings, uh, or Harvey Weinstein. All this stuff was happening at that time. And you feel a little removed from the news, right? Um, but, and so then when the story appeared online and in, in a special section, I, I didn't think uh, it would gain much traction. I mean, uh, something that happened in Ireland a long time ago, people would think it was odd to even be in the newspaper. but. Uh, for some reason, or for many reasons, it had great resonance. It, uh, it has had millions of uh, hits, both in the, in the reading of it online and that video you just saw, uh, in the millions. And not only, and the, and the New York Times analytics will tell you, not only are people clicking on the story, but they're staying with the story for uh, a long time. So that means that they're, they're reading it. Uh, so it's been very uh, uh, successful in that, in that sense. And the reasons why, I think, are many, and they may be related to gender and power, um, uh, uh, which is the, uh, the topic of this evening. Uh, it's a certain time and place in Ireland, but wh why do you think it's resonated on, the, on this side of the Atlantic? Well, there are many things going on. I mean, many, many things going on in the, in the piece. But among them are that at the root of this issue is the systemic and historic subjugation of women uh, uh, in 19th and 20th century Ireland, but it wasn't, it wasn't and isn't peculiar to Ireland. And so the way it worked in Ireland at this time, uh, uh, many of you have heard of the Magdalene Laundries. You know what those were? Okay. 
So just in case you don't, the Magdalen Laundries were set up by the, the government, really, with, with the church acting basically as the management of these facilities, where in the 19th century would be a place where prostitutes would be sent to get them out of society and on the off chance of rehabilit re rehabilitating them. Then in the 20th century, these, these facilities known as Magdalen Laundries uh, were for uh, women who were perceived to be promiscuous or to be too flirtatious or to be too naive and therefore susceptible to getting uh, pregnant outside of marriage. And if you saw uh, any of the movies or any of the documentaries or read anything about it, many of these women would spend their entire lives in these laundries washing linens and clothes for others and not getting paid. So. Uh, in the 1920s, the new Irish government created these mother and baby homes. Now, we should say that these mother and baby homes or institutions like this are not, again, peculiar to Ireland. I mean, I, I grew up on Long Island in New York, and there was a, a facility maybe 10 miles from me called Madonna Heights, and it was for unwed, mostly teenage young women. Um, but uh, this is, uh, Irish government set these up because, if you remember, the, it was basically Irish rebels who, who who won independence from uh, England, uh, and so they're, then they're, they're in charge of this new government, they have many things to worry about, and they basically passed on most, most of the social responsibilities to the Catholic Church. And so these institutions were established by the government, and then in most cases they were run by the Catholic Church, so there was, there was a couple of Protestant institutions. And it was for women who uh, had gotten pregnant outside of marriage, and at that time, there was almost nothing worse. And it could bring uh, disrepute to your family. It could dis bring disrepute to your parish. And so when, say, uh, my, my mother grew up in Ireland, by the way, and would have been uh, you know, susceptible or, or a, a, a possible inhabitant of this if, had, she gotten married, uh, had she gotten pregnant uh, outside of marriage. And what would happen is the fathers oftentimes in the dead of night would take the, the, the young women uh, out of their homes and bring them to this facility so that none of the neighbors would see them. And then there were, there were other cover stories. And so it reflects how women were treated. And if you've got, uh, so in that documentary, you see Peter Mulryan uh, has a sister or a half-sister. His mother got pregnant again, once again outside of marriage. And in the 50s and 60s, the Magdalen Laundries would be for the quote-unquote second offenders women who had uh, gotten pregnant a second time and if it was <laughs> as bad as it was the first time oh my god you're you're now beyond redemption in a way you know so it speaks to the subjugation of women i think that's one of the reasons it was popular or successful and secondly the person who calls uh everybody accountable who who digs for the truth is a woman and she is a quote unquote ordinary woman and i don't mean that in any condescending manner but she's not an academic, she's not a politician, she's not a journalist, she's not coming from a position of societal power, right? And she, she'd be damned, she's gonna find out what happens. So I think for those reasons, the subjugation and the bearing of the truth by a woman is one of the reasons, all in the context of Harvey Weinstein and, and everything else that's been on the news recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, 796 kids, it's a story that spans decades. How did you, did you rely on Catherine as the, the guide to all this? Was, was she the, uh, the, the kind of the human level uh, way to tell the story? Yeah, the story was very complicated to tell or to write. It's written almost as a, a kind of a nonfiction short story. And uh, it, it touches on the, the famine. It touches on the workhouses of the 19th and 20th centuries. It touches on the Catholic Church. It touches on many things. Um, and I needed a character to bring me through it, and who else but this woman? And the reason that she became particularly um, valuable or attractive as a protagonist was her own experience. Uh, so uh, I said to the class this afternoon that I don't remember things that happened to me when I was 30 or 40 or 50. I don't know that man at all, <laughs> Scott McKay. Uh, oh, it just came to me. But, uh, um, but things that happened to me when I was seven or eight or nine or ten 
are as vivid today as they were then. You never forget certain slights in the playground or certain things that were said to you or certain things that you did. And so in talking to Catherine, she mentioned an episode when she was a little girl. She went to a primary school in Chum, and these children, before they were fostered out or adopted out or sent to an industrial school, they would go to this school, and they were treated as second-class citizens within that school. They, they arrived late and left early so that they wouldn't commingle with the quote-unquote legitimate children, okay? And when she's a little girl, she, she plays a little joke on one of, the, uh, one of the, what they're called home babies. She gave her a candy wrapper, and inside the candy wrapper there was nothing. And everybody laughed. It was a funny joke. But Catherine has never, ever forgotten it. And so that's one. And then two, many years later, her mother, who was rather distant and difficult to, uh, to know, uh, even by her own daughter, uh, died, and Catherine went to her uh, home county of Armagh uh, to see if she could learn a little more, and she digs up her mother's birth certificate, and uh, the space for the father is left blank. And so she has this realization as well, that her own mother uh, was quote-unquote illegitimate, and that, in her mind, explained why her mother was so distant and so, uh, you know, uh, not forthcoming about her own childhood, and, and, and filled probably with shame, unnecessarily, but with shame, and that it dictated her life and it dictated her relations with other people. And as Catherine goes through her discovery and her reporting, quite frankly, she sees the same mannerisms among Peter Mulroy and P.J. Harvey and some of these other people. And as you just told the journalism class, when you're recreating a scene, uh, that you weren't there for. You've got to report the, the hell out of it. And so you obviously did that. Is that the word I used? Uh, paraphrasing. The, uh, so um, you obviously did here, but tell us a bit about, I mean, you had to make decisions about what to include and what to leave out. Tell us a bit about what you left out. Uh, in, in writing about this, w uh, another character for me was the, the seven-acre property itself. And so uh, Ireland has no shortage of misery or sad stories. Um, uh, that it's, it's, in the, it's in the songs, it's in, it's in the literature. And this property uh, had been a workhouse, and there was no, uh, there were fewer places worse to be than in a workhouse in Ireland in the, in the 19th century. And so this was built in, in 1846, this workhouse, and uh, almost immediately the, the, the famine struck. And it affected Chum, and it affected that part of Galway significantly, and so this facility was built for 800. Within a year, it had 3,000 people cramming its, its, um, its uh, space. And so um, I got to know a lot about the workhouse, and I never used it. So one of the things that you would do in a workhouse, the, the whole, the, uh, by the way, the workhouse was built specifically to be not inviting, not to be homey. It was meant to be uh, unwelcoming, quite frankly. Um, and so people who had nowhere else to go would stay here and they would work what in order for... Glass on top of the wall? That, it's unclear where that's from. That may be from when, it's, uh, when it was a military barracks, but yeah, that, that doesn't say welcome, does it? Uh, but uh, one of the tasks was oakum picking, and oakum picking was taking rope, old rope, and teasing out the strands uh, and using those strands. And then they, that, those strands that had been uh, taken out would be used for for tar, uh, for boats, and, and, and the like. And that's what the people in a workhouse would do all day long. So I knew that. That didn't get in. There were, there in, in the 1920s, after the, the workhouse closed, it was a military barracks. And during the Irish Civil War, six men from uh, Galway and Mayo, uh, um, IRA men, or men who were opposed to the agreement with uh, uh, England, uh, were executed against the wall. That wall's still standing, actually, on the property. And I knew all about that. I knew that, that they had gone to mass that morning, uh, that they were lined up three at a, uh, in a row, three at a time, that their hands were in prayer as they were shot, uh, and that a priest was muttering prayers beside them as they were shot. This is all on the same grounds. Then after that, it becomes a mother and baby home. So now I know all about, so, you know, and all that doesn't, make, much of that doesn't make the newspaper story, but it informs the, the, uh, the sense of place in my head. And, and there were many little 
um, details I found. So uh, that didn't make the story. So for example, in 1931, um, a woman, a young woman, a teenage woman, writes a, a, a note to her mother. Dear mother, I am very lonesome for my rosary beads. You could put it in the next letter. Please God, I won't be here forever. And if I am, all right. I am young enough yet, and I will hold my head up yet with the help of God. There are more than me here. I am not the first, and I won't be the last. So that was in an early draft. I had to cut it back, cut it back, cut it back. So things like that. And uh, you mentioned your mother, your late mother's birthday is today, correct? Right. And she was from County Galway? Yeah, my mother grew up in a, a small uh, farm in a small village about 40 miles uh, southwest of, of here. And so she would have been, uh, you know, she would, cohorts of hers would have wound up in Chum. That, did her experience help you uh, inform the lay, of, you, you explained the lay of the land. There. You did a lot of research, it sounded like, to know what was going on. Provide the you know, I, I, it's weird. I mean, I, uh, obviously most people in Ireland speak uh, English, but uh, I thought that uh, being the son of a, of a woman from rural Ireland, particularly in Galway, uh, helped me to understand the language and to know the rhythms. And so when I would go to Catherine's house, and I would go to Catherine's house many times, and she had had a conga line of reporters coming in over the years talking to her about this, sometimes questioning her and her motives and such. Uh, I knew that when you go to a person's house, you bring an apple tart. So I kept, I must have bought about 15 apple tarts That's at the supermarket. The it's a little pie. So I would always bring something because you knew that she would put the tea on and you'd have to have something with the tea. And so, uh, and just, you know, the way people express themselves and how, how they would say something indirectly. Oftentimes, you don't say it directly. You come around it sideways, and I could, I could break that code a little bit, I think. Um, the, you know, it's such, um, the, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of reporters have recounted the basic facts of the story. The Irish Examiner was on it, right? And, uh, um, but the way you've presented it, it almost reads like a work of Irish fiction. So can you tell how you had to retell the story in a way it hadn't been told before? What we, how did you try to do that? First of all, in, in Irish journalism, and I, 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 can't, I haven't resolved this in my head, uh, the Irish people are great, great storytellers. That's not news to anybody. But their, their newspaper journalism does not tend to tell stories. They tend to tell the news in a matter-of-fact way and not step back and see something in its universality or to see the, the potential of a story to be told even though it's nonfiction. And so uh, some of these details were known, but no one ever, that sounds arrogant, I don't mean it. What I saw was opportunity with what I was reading, but also in what I was hearing from Catherine and from what I was hearing from her husband about her interior life. And so another thing that makes her heroic to me is that she is um, a, an introvert, but introvert doesn't even capture um, her uh, discomfort in public settings. She doesn't go to the pub, she doesn't go to dances, uh, she gets very nervous when she's around a lot of people. Uh, her world has uh, gotten smaller and smaller so that when she was going into Galway City to do research, that was, that was a stretch for her, even though it's only about 15 miles from where she lives. And so she has panic attacks and she has headaches. And so uh, here's this woman who is much more content being at home, you know, having a cup of tea and in her garden rather than navigating uh, the world beyond uh, the, her grounds. And so reporters like you and I have to talk to people. She doesn't come from that culture, yet she was so moved by what she was realizing as she began to do what was meant to be just a quick historical piece for a local historical journal in Chum, 
um, she had to overcome all those anxieties to put herself in a position where she's calling up the sisters and saying, why is this? She's going to the cemetery, getting records. She's, she's looking at old maps. So that makes her all the more heroic because she had to get past those obstacles as well. Yeah, the, the subhead is Ireland wanted to forget. And so I was curious, like, in retelling those stories, did it help the people who were telling the stories to you or did it cause them a lot of pain to, to bring it all up again? Uh, I think it was painful for them to tell, but they wanted to tell them because I think that they felt that no one was hearing them. They still feel that way. I mean, their stories, the stories of Peter Mulryan and P.J. Haverty at this stage are fairly well known in Ireland, um, but um, they still feel unheard. Uh, they, they, they all went to the Irish Parliament and they were supposed to, uh, 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 an advocate was gonna speak on their behalf and they all were excited to go to Dublin and they expected the entire legislature to, to be there and listen because this was such a, 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 a world-shaking story in Ireland and the chambers were empty. And, and PJ Haverty, I mean, almost broke down recalling that for me. So it's painful to talk about, um, but I think they want to, they want to tell it. Yeah, so Andy Kenny gives that impassioned speech, but that you're saying it's Government's not leaping to action. Or like at the end, it says the, the report is due in 2018. Is that more indicative of the way it's just being brushed off? No, I don't know if it's really being brushed off. I, uh, there, there are many aspects of it. So, just, so uh, there are many complications. So uh, uh, there's a commission that spent the last three years trying to figure this out, okay? Let's not jump to conclusions necessarily. Let's not ascribe ill intentions to these uh, nuns, okay? Uh, so for example, you know, it's important to remember that these, that these nuns were also products of, of um, a patriarchy, both Ireland and the Catholic Church. And they also came from rural backgrounds. And they also, if they had stayed home, they would have been servants to their families or uh, wound up in a, in a loveless arranged marriage. And so they would see the, the, the Sister of Mercy at the local school, and she would have a book. She would have a her own prayer book, and she would be immaculate in her white habit, and, and, and that was attractive to someone who's coming from uh, deprived circumstances. And so, you know, these nuns um, are complicated. If you take a group of nuns, just as if you were to take a group of journalists, some of them are gonna be uh, good, some of them are gonna be bad, and some of them are gonna just be knuckleheads, you know? So that's what it was at Chum, and so, people are like holding off and this commission is trying to dig deeper. Why? What I understand is that they can't, they still have no answer why these children were buried the way they were. This, they still can't, the commission has yet to come up with a, uh, an answer. I mean, you read that and you're outraged. So like, who's, who's to blame? Who, and, and what do you wanna see, what would be good to see happen next? <clears throat> well, I, I think if there's blame, okay, uh, you know, the, the systemic subjugation of women, you know, I don't think that's been resolved. I think we're still working on that, don't you? Um, but um, the, it has to be remembered that these nuns were basically subcontractors to the county council, the Galway County Council, and to the Irish government. The Irish government said, look, we got a lot going on, you take care of this. And then the Irish government and the county council were supposed to have regulatory powers. They were supposed to be going in and saying, uh, how is it being run here, okay? And there are records of where the, 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 the mother superior and the doctor would go to the county council and say, we need more money because we need these vaccines because gastroenteritis is running through the, the wards or because um, we know there's a fever coming. And it's not clear whether they always got their funding. So that's one, two, uh, wouldn't it be up to the county council to say, as Catherine does in that documentary, uh, okay, we have a lot of deaths here, <laughs> you know, where are they being buried? And so uh, my sense is that it cost um, five pounds to bury someone in the cemetery in Chum, which my hand to God is across the street from this facility, okay? it's. Uh, it's like right over there, okay? But it cost five pounds. So if you're having 
two, three dozen children, sometimes four dozen children dying a year, and you times that by five pounds, and you're trying to take care of a bunch of children, many of whom may have had uh, uh, poor prenatal uh, care. You know, their mothers may not have uh, been well nourished or, or, or uh, what have you. Um, maybe that was, maybe all of this is about economics. That's one. Two, the fact that they were illegitimate, the children were illegitimate, even though they were baptized, perhaps in the view of the church at that time, not only the sisters, but the chaplain from the archdiocese. That's another thing. The archdiocese of Chum, with a huge cathedral, is maybe a half mile from the home. So you could see the cathedral from the mother and baby home. It looms over the home, right? So the chaplain had to know the chaplain who was responsible for the home had to know, hey, where are all these kids? What happened? They're, done, you know, they're, they're supposed to get uh, um, extreme unction. They're supposed to have a, uh, a, a requiem mass. And then they're supposed to be buried in consecrated ground. So it's not just the nuns. Where was the county council and where was the archdiocese? Um, this, the uh, series this year here at Raj Williams is talking about race, gender, and power. Not just race, gender, and power, but talking about it. They, does the, do you see in the reaction to this story, or uh, just over here in the United States, um, a, a greater willingness to talk about gender and power um, and race? Uh, and did you see it with this story? In the United States as opposed to Ireland? or oh. um, <clears throat> The story, uh, I was afraid uh, that the story would be uh, roundly criticized in Ireland you know, here comes some yank passing judgment. Why don't you deal with your uh, American Indians? Why don't you deal with your African Americans? You're coming over here and, and you're giving us grief. Um, that did not happen. As a matter of fact, it was widely embraced and used as a jumping off point to discuss yet again um, how women were and are being treated. I mean, right now there's an issue in Ireland uh, centering around abortion still. Um, so I think that um, it, it, uh, it, it continued to um, provide oxygen to that conversation uh, uh, about uh, gender and politics. Uh, there, there's also, a, a, quite frankly, an, an anti-Catholic strain to some of this argument. And then there's a, a, a counter-argument. Well, you know, let's not, um, let's not go th too far with that because you know, they're all of a piece and of a time. Um, so that's the conversation now. If we, if we want to look at power, the power would have been the Catholic Church. And the power and the influence of the Catholic Church in Ireland has diminished so dramatically in the last 25 years, in part because of the Magdalene Laundries, but also because of a series of heinous priest scandals that predated the ones that we experienced, say, in Boston and, and the rest of uh, the United States. And I think it has you know, contributed, you know, in some way to the conversation that's been going on here because of the Harvey Weinstein, James Toback, yada, yada, yada yeah, when issues. When you about the reaction millions of people, are you talking about mostly in the United States? Or uh, no, you know, I, I don't know how to, get, I didn't do the analytics on that, but um, uh, it, it went around the world. So I know from emails and from uh, online chatter that it, it wasn't, um, only in the United States where the story found traction. We talked about this a bit in the journalism class, but you know, telling the story like this with this compelling documentary, um, you know, what do you lose and what do you gain uh, by telling the story that way? They'll be telling it more that way in the future. Right. This is a this is a this is a an issue in journalism now in in, in the digital age. Uh, it used to be text was dominant, image. Uh, was secondary. Mary Murphy will tell you what that was like over the years. And uh, over the last, you know, say 15 years, there's been a uh, recalibrating of that and a recognition of the power of the image. And so now in the digital age with multimedia and with, with uh, video, um, the, the challenge is not to have um, the video and the text uh, uh, repetitive not tell the same story, not duplicate. Um, and so uh, my story in print, or, or, or rather the text story, uh, really um, is different from what you just saw. Uh, this video 
and, and I worked on it, and Cassie Brack and I've worked with for many years, uh, she was the videographer, um, we, we, taught, we had many discussions. How are we going to do this? How are we going to break it up? And so this was an opportunity for the home babies, uh, the adult home babies, the, the survivors, to really um, lay out who they were and how they felt, which is less so in the story uh, that I wrote. So uh, picture yourself at St. Bonaventure when you were in college just a few years ago. Um, what would you have uh, wanted, uh, what do you wish a New York Times reporter had told you then that you know now? Uh, whether, whether about journalism or life or gender and power or whatever. You got, you got a few college students here. About journalism? Or, or life. Uh, first of all, I, I, I wish they had told me how much fun I'd have. Uh, it wasn't all that clear in the beginning. So I've been very blessed to uh, be working in journalism and in newspapers for 35 years. And many of my uh, colleagues over the years are no longer in journalism because of uh, the, 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 the woeful diminishing of that product, I think. Um, eh, do I get an amen on that? Uh, Scott or <laughs> Mary? We have some former Providence Journal people here. Um, so, and gender and power, uh, you know, even though St. Bonaventure was a Catholic university and a Franciscan university, it was uh, ahead of its time in, in recognizing a gender inequality. And uh, I met my wife there, and uh, if I didn't know it, she made it clear to me. <laughs> so. Switch microphones. I promise I'd only ask them ten questions, and we're gonna—I'll uh, run the microphone and let these folks really. You can stay there, and I'll run this around. Just got the first question. Here. Dan, I don't know whether this article caused me more anguish or made me angrier. I think it's angrier, but I—I um, I just want to have a, a comment and a question. These eight hundred odd babies were martyrs. They didn't die for their faith, they died because of the Catholic Church. And I would love to see you personally present this article to Pope Francis. Okay, so you want me to be excommunicated? <laughs> you Thank mean you, you're not Barbara. already? <laughs> you know, you know, a lot of people will blame the Catholic Church and there's, there's some of that. Um, but there is, it is true too that uh, no one else gave a damn about them. No one, okay? So the Catholic Church had a vested interest in these children. At least they would be baptized, okay? And then there's some discussion now about whether those children were adopted out um, and that it was a money-making operation for the church. This is what it was like in Ireland in 1951. The actress Jane Russell uh, came to Ireland and announced before she left for Ireland, she said, I'm going to Ireland to get a baby. Just like that, the way you would say, I'm, you know, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, Seacock to get a car. So she uh, flew to Ireland and uh, went to one of these homes, picked out a baby, sort of looked like Ed, and, um, and uh, you know, there was a little kerfuffle, but she said, oh, no, no, it'll be okay. And she brought that baby home. And the baby grew up in the United States, had a difficult adulthood and, and die young, but that's how wide open it was, okay? Some of that is the Catholic Church, some of that is the Irish government, okay? And, and um, the children that, that they were um, taking care of in the home oftentimes had lousy care in, in uh, the prenatal stage. So, you know, who's, whose fault is that? You know, that's even before they came to the Catholic Church. So I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not apolo believe me, I'm not apologizing for the Catholic Church and, you know, I, the story speaks for itself, but I think it's more complicated than that and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not running to be excommunicated. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, point well taken, Barbara. So. Right. Joint question. Hi, so um, we were wondering, firstly, how you got word of the story and why it piqued your interest, what reasons made it attractive to your interest. Right. Uh, the story uh, first broke in 2014. So Catherine reported her findings. It was ignored. And then she went to a local uh, newspaper, or rather a national newspaper, and they, they did a, a big story 
uh, and it was news, but even then people didn't believe uh, what they were reading, and so there, that cast a pall on the story and on Catherine. And that commission that I referred to was formed shortly thereafter. And then in March of this year, they announced some findings saying, okay, we don't know what's going on here, but this is what we do know. Um, they, did, uh, they did some digging, they did some testing, and they found um, human remains of children dating from this period. So they're not famine bones. It's always a big, Ireland is littered with famine bones, sadly. And so whenever you hear about a body being found or a skeletal remains being found, the first reaction is, oh, it's, them's famine bones. Uh, that dispelled um, the notion that these were famine bones. So when I read that story, uh, I, I just saw <coughs> opportunity. I just saw something larger than what was being reported. And oftentimes it was being reported incorrectly. 796 babies found in a septic tank. That hasn't happened. Okay, and so the fact that the story was being told piecemeal and uh, oftentimes inaccurately, uh, I'm, I'm a competitive guy and I'm a storyteller. I like going to Ireland. Uh, I, saw, I saw a story that, that was more universal than Irish in a way, because as we said, it was about women, it was about, it was also about death. It was about how the dead remain with us, or what do we do with our dead? And the Times is doing a few stories about this vexing question, you know, the dead, and how, how they remain with us, and how, how we pay respects, or should we repay, pay respects? And in Ireland, this is a big issue, and it was of a piece, okay? Um, obviously, with dealing with Catholic Church is a very big, prominent you know, person to go against. Say that again? Obviously, dealing with the Catholic Church is a very prominent thing to go against and to find stories about. Did you, be, did you occur with any like pushback from the Catholic Church or kind of like keeping it under secretive with them? Or was it kind of like Yeah, that's a good question. So um, This sounds silly, but some of my best friends are nuns, okay? Do you know what I'm saying? I know that in uh, parishes in New York City, everyone else has left, and the, and the people who are working and doing social justice and social work are nuns, often in their 60s and 70s, and everyone else has left. And so, the, so I know a lot of nuns who have given their lives to the cause, and they are not the stereotype with the, you know, fine... Uh, left hook, you know. So, uh, and I, I went to parochial school. So the, the Bon Secours um, had refused to talk about this. And I really made an effort to get their side of the story to say, look, there's context here. Please tell us what's happening. Silence, a no comment from religious order or from anyone in this kind of situation does not serve that, that order or that institution well. I'm taking my time with this. I'm not caught up in some kind of like heated deadline situation with the Irish Times or the Irish Examiner. I'm slowing it down. I want to know what happened. And I wrote many plaintive emails to their spokesman. He came back and said, it's my understanding that because we've given testimony before the commission, we are precluded by law to speak outside of the, the confines of that commission. We cannot uh, say what we testify to, or we cannot share information. Um, I called up the commission, or I emailed the commission. I said, is it true that if someone testifies before the commission, um, they are precluded from speaking about their testimony outside of the commission, similar to a grand jury situation here in the United States? You know, if I testify before a grand jury, I can go outside and say, you know what I told them? That's what I, you can do that, okay? And so the commission wrote back and said, there's nothing to preclude anyone from speaking outside of the commission about what they testified to. So in other words, Bones of Coors could tell me what happened, okay? Um, and uh, I wrote back to the spokesman, I said, 
here's what I was just told, okay? In fact, I, I cut and pasted a part of the email. I said, I just want to hear what happened, and, and we can talk about it. It'll be contextual. You know, uh, you know I'm not looking to, to uh, make the sisters, you know, uh, Beelzebub. I'm not. What happened here? It's more complicated. Life is complicated. We like to think of it as black and white. It's gray. We live, we, we inhabit the gray. Um, and uh, it didn't play. I don't know what to do. I mean, it, it actually upset me because as a reporter and as a storyteller, you want to know as much as you can. You know, sometimes it's easier. Oh, no comment? Good. We can bag them. I don't, I don't, uh, the best reporters don't operate that way. They want to push for something beyond the no comment. And the Bon Secours uh, declined that repeated offer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I can attest to Irish nuns because I was taught by several. What, what order? Blame on in New York. I'm what order, though? What orders? Um, I don't know if it was the Mercy or the Franciscan. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I don't remember. I don't care to. <laughs> um, uh -oh. They, I have to actually say that, and I did go to Catholic elementary and a Catholic high school, but only for two years in the Catholic high school I got out. Mm -hmm. That, again, not to put blame, but I think during that era of the 1940s and 50s, because I'm not like young, some of the people here, they were very brutal. Mm -hmm. um, so I would attest to the fact that they were part of it, along with what other category you want to use during that time in Ireland. But, um, I can actually say that the nuns were very, very bad. Sure. Well, uh, where in New York? Um, Queens, originally. Um, I went to St. Mary's Elementary School from first grade to eighth, and then my parents bought a house in Rocker Center, Long Island area, mm -hmm. and then I went to St. Agnes High School. Did you go to St. Agnes? Why did you? No, I, St. Agnes. So, I went to St. Anthony's High School. St. Anthony's. So I have to... Um, kind of agree that during that era in that time then, that I'm sure there was a lot of that. No, I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. And my mother, my mother was raised in Ireland until 15 and had the nuns and has had this similar difficult stories about nuns. Um, but I also went to parochial school and, and some nuns you knew to stay away from or you knew no matter what you did, uh, you would get hit. And then there were other nuns who um, were nurturing. And in fact, one of the men who is quoted in the, in the story, he went, to the, um, he went to the Mercy School as well uh, with the home babies. His name is Kevin O'Dwyer. And when he was six years old, his, um, his father died. And he said the nuns really uh, took care of him, he said. And so he had a, a soft spot in his heart for these women. But he said he also couldn't reconcile that love that he was receiving and that nurturing with what he was seeing in, in how the home babies, the quote unquote illegitimate children, were being treated by some of those same nuns. So. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering when the report comes out in 2018, what your intention is to further the um, the article and the story and the everything that's going on. I'm just going to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought so. I'll be moving on to another story about the Pawtucket Red Sox. Excellent choice. Uh, I, I should have brought my hat. Oh, it's in my jacket. Um, obviously, they'll be in Massachusetts. yeah, they'll be in Massachusetts. I won't wear the hat then. Um, uh, obviously, uh, when there's something, some movement in this story in this case, I'll, I'll report on it, and maybe I'll get to go back to Ireland, so that won't be so bad. Speaking of Pawtucket, I see that Rhode Island Attorney General Peter Comartin is, in, is with us today, so any, any question from, uh, for uh, our speaker? Welcome. Uh, we're in Pawtucket. Uh, currently, Armistice Boulevard. I grew up over near Broadway and Central Avenue, right near the stadium. I, I lived in Maynard. Oh. Yeah. Right off of uh, Walcott you're, Street. You're St. Ray's, right? Yeah. 
Absolutely. I read your book, by the way. Great book. Uh, thank you. It was with one of your characters in it about two weeks ago. He, who brought you up? Who? Uh, commonly referred to as Hood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. We'll talk about that well, later. I know Hood. Yeah, I know Hood well. Um, I didn't want to take, actually, I didn't want to ask any questions because I wanted the students to ask the questions because, uh, although I have a plethora of them. But I will ask one. Has the government, um, having been in the position of not wanting to say all I want to say publicly due to an ongoing act of investigation or a grand jury or otherwise, has the government in Ireland taken that position awaiting the outcome of the report so far? After the uh, report came out in March of this year, confirming that these were uh, significant human remains of children from the fetal age to three years. Um, and to Kenny, you saw the Prime Minister um, speak to that, and uh, various clerics came out and said things. Um, but um, I think the problem for the government is what do we do now? So this is seven acres in Chum, okay? So just imagine, uh, you know, a, a part of this campus. And uh, the home was knocked down. Uh, housing was built on top of that property, uh, uh, subsidized housing. And some of the properties turned into a playground. So if they confirm that there are hundreds of children buried beneath this, what do you do? And that's, that's where the government is now, okay? And the, the options are uh, you do nothing. You continue to allow children to play above the bones of children. Uh, you, uh, you create some kind of memorial on part of the property. Uh, or you dig them up and um, try to figure out a, a, a place where they can be buried in sacred ground rather than in the remains of a septic system. But if you do that, uh, at what cost? Do you tear down all, those ha all that housing? Then there's the question of compensation for the home babies who were treated poorly over the years and don't know where they're, whatever happened to their mothers. A lot of these people never found their mothers. Okay? They, they, they were denied the right to find their mothers. And that's what Catherine, yet another aspect of her heroism is, that on her own free time and with her own money, she helps these people try to find where their mothers went, oftentimes to England, and oftentimes the mothers are dead. And then is the question of the adoptions. So was there a shadowy operation of children being marked as dead, listed as dead, but actually being trafficked to the United States for money? This is, this is a real question. This isn't fantasy. Um, so the government, I think, is um, keeping its counsel because who knows what hell's a poppin' is, uh, is awaiting them, you know? And you, you said the number's not 796. Do they have an estimate of how many bodies are, are there? Um, no, so 796 children died uh, while in this home from 1925 to 1961. So pause and do the math on that. How many children were dying every year, okay? Um, that's a problem. Um, but uh, all we know is that there are no um, there are no burial records for 796 children. There are burial records for two other children from the tomb home, and they are buried in that cemetery across the street. And what distinguishes them, as opposed to the other 796, is that they were legitimate. They were orphaned. Their parents had died, and then they were living at the home. So they're in the Catholic sense and also in the Irish societal sense at that time, legitimate, different, among us, not over there. Another question? Yeah, this uh, legitimacy of, uh, of the church is really um, at the core of all this. And it, it seems, you know, that certainly goes back centuries, particularly in Ireland because of the strong uh, Catholic uh, mm -hmm. overlay mm -hmm. in Ireland for such a mm -hmm. decade, uh, decade, centuries. Sure. Oftentimes underground, though. So, you know, the, uh, the story that you 
tell about Schwamm is, uh, is just one of many, really. Well, that's, a, that's another question. Going back to your uh, point, um, uh, this wasn't the only mother and baby home. There were at least, uh, at least 14, um, if not 18 of these homes around the country because this was a governmental response to the problem of uh, unwed mothers. And so um, the deaths in some of the other homes were higher than Chum. Chum isn't the worst in terms of the number of deaths. Uh, in one in Cork, in Bestboro, um, there was a, for, for a period of almost two decades, there was a, a baby dying every two weeks. Um, why? You know, why? So 26 babies on average every year. And so that's another question that the Irish government has to deal with, you know. Uh, not in, in those situations, though, they were not buried, uh, th they were buried properly as far as we know. That's what distinguishes Chum, so. But all those homes, not all of those homes were run by Catholic orders. Some were run by Protestant orders. A few, a minor, uh, a, a small amount. A dialogue going on in Ireland about the fact that these women were poor, taken advantage of, you know, naive, and there are all these men who were impregnating them. And I mean, up until, like you said, they closed in the 90s. Uh, so, I mean, it, today, is there any kind of dialogue going on about the role of men and their their relationship to women? There, there's actually a lot of women? yeah. There's actually a lot of academic study. And to your point, uh, you know. Many of these, uh, I don't know what the number is, but it's, it's acknowledged by academics that many of these young women, say, in a small village, uh, not unlike where my mother was from, were impregnated by relations or were raped by the boy down the street, uh, you know, the, the, the fair-haired elder son. And, you know, the, the, you know the, the daughter is asked, you know, who did this to you? And you say it's Clancy down the street. Uh, uh, well, you, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone you're going to the home. Sometimes what they would do is they, they'd go to England, actually, or the child would be uh, born and then presented as the child of, of uh, an older sister who was married, so it was legitimate. Um, but the, the question of responsibility, if you go back and look at the, the, the governmental papers on this issue, there's almost no mention of the responsibility of the men up until the mid-1930s, and then a law was passed allowing women to pursue the fathers of the child, the father of the child, for, for support. Uh, but even then, the shame is on the mother, it's not on the father, and the preponderance uh, 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 of, of evidence was up to her, and so the, the whole society was disinclined to believe her, or to, even if they did believe her, come on, you were asking for it. Come on, you you know you were you were flirting and that stuff, and that that lasted. Uh, I I don't know if it's entirely gone. I don't know if it's entirely gone from where we live in the United States. I mean, it's not just Ireland, but Ireland had a particularly uh, repressive understanding of sex throughout the 20th century. So. But the the dialogue, Mary, is is it, I mean, there there are reams of academic papers on this specific question. It's a big big issue in Irish academia right now. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'd say most writers are probably naturally preoccupied with writing about death. Um, but you mentioned that the New York Times seems to have an ongoing fascination with the topic. Should we be reading anything more into that? Or w what's going on that, that's sort of guiding a lot of news stories lately? You think, you think we're preoccupied with death? <laughs> you know why? People keep dying. Um, <laughs> What happened, you know, yeah. so, you know, if people, yeah, if people die in, in tragic circumstances, say, in, uh, in Las Vegas or what have you, we're going to have to write about it. That's, that's one, and, and they, they may, I, I don't know if it's a preoccupation. Uh, I, I don't know if we're keeping up with it because of these mass shootings. That's, that's, that's one thing. Two, uh, a colleague of mine wrote a story, it was a beautiful story, about the right to die law in Canada. 
and uh, there was a gentleman who had decided um, he was terminally ill, and he decided, I'm going to have my own wake, I'm going to attend my own wake, and then that'll be that. And so he was kind enough to give this reporter and a videographer uh, access to his last days. And so it's a beautiful documentary or video, if you haven't seen it, where they're singing uh, the parting glass around his bed, and they're having a drink. And then he says goodbye to all his loved ones. He's not crying. Everyone else is crying, but he's, he's ready. And then he's wheeled out and down the hall of this hospital, and then the gurney turns right into the room where he will, he will uh, die uh, with his, you know, at his wish. Um, so that prompted the idea of, well, how, how do we process death around the world? And so this one, this story, Chum, was the second one of those series. I was going to do it anyway, you know, but it seemed to fit within this, this pattern. Now there, there's another one coming from Japan, another one from Haiti, and uh, another one from South America, just looking at how we deal with death. Um, I don't know. I'd be glad to write a happy story after this. That's a true story. <laughs> All right. I'll go back to Pawtucket. All right. We have time for one more question. Who's got a good one? <laughs> Being nice. <laughs> the woman over there that has the, yes, scarf on that just put her hand up. She made a good um, idea, and you said you would be excommunicated. Okay. If there's so much abuse in the Catholic religion regarding children, that the men or women that have also in the past, why not, why not write to the Pope? You write well. Uh, and I, don't, I, don't, I have no problem writing to the Pope. That's a joke. And, 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 ex, and ex, okay, good. And ex, what, what do you want, how do you want me to begin that letter? However you want to. Okay. In, in, in regards to the situation that we're talking about. In okay, so your, your, your wish is that I write a letter to the Pope about a story I wrote. In regards to, yes, in regards to what you found out in Ireland, what has happened to these children, okay. and see what he has to say. Okay, well, first of all, I think he's probably aware of it. Okay, that, that's first. Second of all, uh, it's not my job to, like, write a letter to the Pope. I don't, believe me, I don't care. Uh, I don't have any hesitancy to write a letter to the Pope. I don't know if that's what I should be doing, okay? And as... Uh, and, and I am Catholic, but I'm Catholic in a cultural sense at this point. I can't shake that no more than you can shake being an Irish Catholic. Whether you go to the church, that's a different question. It's, it's in my DNA, and so I struggle with that. I struggle with the sex abuse. I struggle with Magdalene laundries. I struggle with what I just reported. If I wasn't struggling with it, I wouldn't write about it. So, you know, I'm sure that the Pope knows about this. One more bonus question. Thank you. Um, Dan, first I just want to... Thank you for writing this article. The President Clarence um, two weeks ago I picked up the Sunday edition of the New York Times and opened up the paper, saw the picture of these adorable children, and began to read. But I didn't know what I was in for when I started, only to find out how painstaking, how heartbreaking, and how heart-wrenching it was to read that. But I thought I owed it to the children and their parents and, you know, and their mothers to read that. So thank you for sharing it. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's give Dan a big round of applause. Thank you for coming. Excellent story. Excellent presentation. Dan has two books. Uh, there are two of Dan's books on sale in the back. Bottom of the 33rd and The Boys in the Bunkhouse, which our journalism class has read. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks very much.